It's crazy how it's already been a year since the release of my electric mountain bike build video. It's now the most popular video on my YouTube channel. Seeing as the interest in building an electric bike has climbed significantly since the start of COVID-19, I figured that I would make another video addressing some of the questions and concerns that a few of the viewers have voiced in the comments, along with just general things I have improved on since then. A while after I published my first video, my rear tire went flat. To my understanding, this was the product of using a cheap tube, as well as the low tire pressure that caused the tube to pinch whenever I hit a bump. The tube I use now is made by Slime. Slime is a liquid tire sealant company that makes, well, sealant for your tires. You fill your tubes with this sealant and supposedly the sealant hardens and patches small holes and tears. Well, this is not to say that it doesn't have its limitations. If the tear is big enough, the tube will still rupture and lose air. But in the event that you get a tiny pinch or a small branch that has poked through the tube, it will seal off the leak. It seems to have worked fine, so I'll give an update in the future if it ever does leak air. Next, I changed out my tires for the Schwab Marathon Plus. This model is highly praised in the e-bike community for its outstanding durability. They are made specifically for the aggressive wear and speeds that e-bikes are capable of reaching. Schwab makes three variants of the Marathon Plus tire. Road, Cross Country, and Trail. Road is, well, the road tire. The Cross Country is a cross country tire, which means it has a solid contact patch along the middle with treaded sides. And well, the trail is fully treaded, like a stubby mountain bike tire. The one I went with is the cross country variant. If you want the lowest wear and greatest range, I would recommend the road model, but that's not suited for any off-road riding. For the average biker that spends most of his time on the road and does some light trail riding like me, get the cross country. These tires are rare to source locally, for me, in Vancouver at least. And the shops that had it in Vancouver sold them at a hefty premium. So I went online and located a Chinese bike distributor that sold them for around $55 per tube. I highly recommend getting a set. And basically, if you can take one thing away, it's to use slime. At the company I worked at EVs over the summer, which does EV sales, repairs, and rides, the one wheels that had tire sealant inside of them were the ones that needed to be replaced from wear, not punctures. The main concern with slime that a mountain biker would propose is that your rotating mass is increased, which will result in more mass required to spin the tire. But because we have an electric motor, the additional mass is negligible. The first major problem I ran into was in mid-July as I was commuting to work, I began to hear a clicking and clacking sound coming from my rear wheel. The video you're watching right now is all I have. I tried tightening the spokes, disassembling the derailleur, cleaning the gears, changing out the spacers in the hub, and checking for shorts in the motor controller. At last, the final straw was to disassemble the motor. Using a bearing puller, I pushed the stator away from the magnets and removed the stator from the hub. Upon further examination, I identified two bearings, one that's used in the cassette and one that's used for the casing. Turns out the balls inside both of the bearings were shattered. This was a result of a larger underlying issue. As I mentioned in my last video, the motor I received from the seller was wider than the one I wanted. So to fit the motor into the dropouts, or the space of the frame that fits the wheel, I had to stretch the frame out. This introduced a significant amount of external stress on the bearings from the frame pushing inwards. Additionally, the stress from tightening down the lock nuts to keep the wheel in place have also caused quite a bit of force on it. This caused the balls to shatter and clack as the wheels spun. The image you see right now illustrates why the balls have shattered inside of the bearing. A bearing is designed so that the majority of the mass or force is distributed in this direction. But the force I was putting on it came from this direction as well as this direction, putting in significant amount of stress on a weak point. The most intuitive way to fix this problem is to reduce the number of gears I had from seven to six or I could switch to a single gear system and eliminate the need for a derailleur. The benefits that would come with this are that there are fewer points of failures, and the drawbacks would be that I would only have three gears at my disposal. 
In my case, I needed all six gears or as many gears as I can get as I live in a hilly area, as well as the sheer mass of this bike, which makes it a pain to pedal without electric assist or a gear system. So removing a single stack on the cassette is the method I went for. To extract both bearings, I ordered a bearing puller. Bearing pullers are designed for this exact application, so by placing the hub in the freezer, which contracts the metal by a small margin, both bearings popped right out. Replacing the old bearings are a set of genuine deep grooved sealed NTN Japanese bearings. And here's real time me explaining how I installed them. I have to squeeze the new bearings into the old hub. So this is the hub, um, the cassette rests uh, right here and these are the new Japanese NTN bearings that I ordered from eBay um, and what I did was I used the bearing extractor to pull the old bearing out and then I got the new bearings I measured them got the new bearings they arrived and what I did was I used these impact sockets that coincidentally fit right over the side of the bearing and um, I put that on Got a piece of cloth that I put in between the uh, metal and the metal because you never want metal and metal contact. And then I put these two together, put it into the vise, and then use the vise to squeeze it together. The reason why you need to use the vise is because um, you want the bearing to be seated equally downwards. You don't want one side to go down first and then the other side is lopsided like that or else you will warp the outer shell of the bearing. So that's what I did. Use the vise so you have equal clamping power on both ends, and then now it's in. So these are the new NTN bearings on here. So yeah, we're done. The next part goes out to my coworker, Steve. He recommended the Grin V4 torque arm. It's pretty expensive at $45 plus shipping, but I believe it's worth every penny. Cut from quarter inch steel and using the two included hose clamps, this torque arm works wonders. I would recommend this specific torque arm for anyone that's running a hub motor e-bike conversion with over 750 watts. Fun fact, the one I used prior or the most popular one or the one you'll find on AliExpress or eBay was also made by Grin. From what I know, this was the V1 torque arm but was quickly discontinued as it had flaws in its ability to transfer torque. The last thing I did to my bike was improve my 3D printed electronics holder. In this V2 design, the cable holder thickness was reduced by 40%. I added heat inserts for M3 screws and expanded the internal storage volume. To fit the reduction in size, I shortened the wires and added XT60s to the phase wires, as well as a JSTXH 5S connector for the sensor wires. A year later, I can confidently say that this project is still a work in progress. It's been fun though. I've learned quite a bit and boy is it fun to rip on the streets to match the speed of cars. Anyways, I'll have to get back to studying for my calculus finals, so like and subscribe, and I'll see you on my next video. Thanks for watching, and bye bye.